In 2005, Double Fine Studios released their debut game, Psychonauts, and it was largely considered a commercial failure. The game initially sold fewer than 100,000 units and contributed to a huge net loss for publisher Majesco. Despite this failure, in 2015, Psychonauts 2 was announced, along with a crowdfunding campaign looking to raise $3.3 million to help with development costs. Not only was the campaign able to reach the goal in a little over a month, but by the end of 2016, they managed to raise $4 million through crowdfunding to make the long-awaited sequel a reality. How is this even possible? How did a game which was considered a flop develop this level of hype and a cult following? Hey guys, James here again, and today I want to talk about Psychonauts. With Psychonauts 2 slated to, hopefully, come out soon, I decided to replay the first Psychonauts and I wanted to make a video to serve as a sort of retrospective into this platforming gem. Why did it fail? What made it so special? Does it still hold up today? And what can Psychonauts 2 do to stand out? Join me today as we explore Psychonauts. And of course, this goes without saying, I'm going to be spoiling the game quite a bit, so here's your warning. Now before I begin, I want to get my personal biases with the game out of the way. Psychonauts is one of my favorite games ever, and honestly, a lot of it isn't even because of the core gameplay itself. I truly think that despite the game's flaws, Psychonauts is truly one of a kind and a great experience. Psychonauts is the brain child of Tim Schafer and the brilliant minds at Double Fine Studios. Tim and numerous others at Double Fine started out as part of LucasArts, one of the early titans in gaming. Together they created classic and hilarious point-and-click adventure games like Monkey Island, Day of the Tentacle, and Grim Fandango. However, as the gaming landscape began to change, many of the great minds at LucasArts began to leave and some joined forces to create Double Fine in 2000. Five years later, Double Fine came out with their debut project, Psychonauts, and man, what a debut it was. First, to understand part of why the game might have failed, we need to look at how gaming was beginning to change in the 2000s. Throughout most of gaming history, the platformer was a huge staple. Then, in 1996, Mario 64 came out and revolutionized gaming, ushering in an age of great 3D platformers. The next few years were filled with classic collectathon style 3D platformers like Banjo Kazooie in 98 and Donkey Kong 64 in 99. In 2000, Double Fine was created, and in 2001, they began development on Psychonauts. However, in 2001, a game would come out which would shake up the gaming world. Halo Combat Evolved was to FPS gaming what Mario 64 was to the 3D platformer. Suddenly, the FPS genre was the king in the US market and everyone wanted to create the next big console shooter. While this revolution was happening, Double Fine was still refining and finishing up their take on the collectathon 3D platformer and this shift in gaming is part of why I believe the game failed. Not only was Psychonauts a game seemingly designed for a past age, but there were numerous development and publishing issues extending the release of the game past the initial timeline of 2 years and taking 5 years in total to get out. So now let's start diving into the actual game and see what makes Psychonauts not so great. Honestly, the platforming in Psychonauts is not the best, and yeah, it's kinda wild honestly, the platforming in a classic platformer is actually one of its weaknesses. I do feel like for the most part the platforming feels fine. Certain texts feel snappy, maybe even overly so, where it can feel slightly unnatural at times. But while the platforming isn't awful, I do feel like a combination of the camera and the sometimes inconsistent sticking to platforms and objects can make it a bit frustrating and feel a little bit dated. Especially considering how smooth some modern platformers feel, this will definitely be the worst part of the experience for gamers revisiting the game. To me, Psychonauts is a game about delivering an experience, rather than say, giving you the best platform mechanics and sections. In many ways, Psychonauts is actually more of a puzzle adventure game, drawing on the experience of many of those at Double Fine from their time at LucasArts. I think that maybe with their history of comedic point and click adventure games, it makes sense that the platforming may not have been perfect, and instead, where Psychonauts really shines is in its great writing and sense of humor. I think the opening in particular is a great example to illustrate how solid the writing is. The human mind. 600 miles of synaptic fiber, five and a half ounces of cranial fluid, 1500 grams of complex neural matter, a three pound pile of dreams. But I'll tell you what it really is. It is the ultimate battlefield. And the ultimate weapon. The wars of this modern age, the psychic age, are all fought somewhere between these damp, curvaceous undulations. You start with what appears to be a military man speaking about the human brain and the warfare conducted through it. It's dramatic and terrifying. 
mental marines who are about to ship out on the adventure of their lives. This is our beachhead, and this is your landing craft. You shall engage the enemy in his own mentality. You shall chase his dreams. You shall fight his demons. You shall live his nightmares. And those of you who fight well, you will find yourselves on the path to becoming international secret agents. In other words, psychonauts. The rest of you will die. But then you find he's just talking to a group of kids. You find out that you're actually at Whispering Rock's Psychic Summer Camp, a summer camp for the weird and gifted to learn to use their psychic abilities and eventually train to become a psychonaut. You're then introduced to the protagonist of our tale. My name starts with a D. Is Rasputin. Turns out, he has a really powerful but untrained mind that even the camp counselors have trouble corralling. This first scene sets up so much. The setting, the humor, the main character Raz, a glimpse at the other kids, including your love interest, Lily, the counselors, in particular Coach Oleander, some foreshadowing about a light monster! And then some intrigue with these final lines. But he has mental defenses like I've never seen in someone so young. If I could just get him in my lab for some experiments, I'm sure he could withstand more than the others. That kid's one in a million, Nine. But I'm not gonna let you turn him into one of your guinea pigs. I got big plans for that mind. All of that in around five minutes. The story as a whole is solid all around, although maybe a bit predictable at times. I think what I really enjoy so much about the writing though are just the little interactions and jokes that occur through the various cutscenes and parts of the game. For example, when it comes to your fellow campmates, these interactions will change depending on what part of the game you're at, and even in my fourth playthrough of this game, I managed to find some different scenes which I had never noticed before. The people down there look like ants, don't they? They are ants, Crystal. Cruel, cruel little ants. Then you add in all the funny little interactions with the various side characters in each level. Why don't you come in here and do that, tough guy? And I think you end up with one of the funniest gaming experiences I've ever had. At times, some of the humor might be kind of dumb or immature. But I still think it's genuine and hilarious. Undoubtedly, the heart of Psychonauts is in its writing, and I believe this care put in the writing carried through throughout the game and really helped to build and execute what I think is a great world and concept. After the initial cutscene, you wake up for basic braining, the first class and real gameplay tutorial you have. However, instead of requiring you to go to class immediately, you're given this initial summer camp area to explore. What I love about this first area is that if you decide to explore it, you find that you can jump on nets, slide down slopes, swing on branches, walk across ropes, and this first area, similar to Peach's Castle, is just a great place to get acclimated to the platforming as well as some of the collectathon aspects of the game. Around the campus, you'll be able to scour the grounds to find Psy cards and Psy challenge markers which you can collect to level up and learn different psychic powers. Not only that, but in the world you're also able to collect buried arrowheads which are the main currency, as well as the 16 scavenger hunt items which can also be used to level up Raz. I particularly like the setting of the summer camp and how they implement it into the design and progression of the game. One of Raz's goals in the game is to earn camp merit badges to become an official psychonaut. Some badges, like the basic braining and oarsman badges, act as natural barriers to different areas of the game, although the oarsman badge is kind of pointless. A number of the badges, such as marksmanship, levitation, shield, clairvoyance, and confusion are earned through the different levels in the game. Meanwhile, abilities like telekinesis, pyrokinesis, and invisibility can be obtained by finding collectibles in the game to level up Raz. Leveling up isn't terribly difficult, which I think is a good thing, because again, I feel like the platforming and collectathon aspects of the game really aren't the main draw of Psychonauts. Early on, in the first level basic braining, you also learn about the collectibles within people's minds. These include figments of imagination, which are the basic collectible to help you level up, and there's actually a ton of these in every level. There's also emotional baggage, a collectible you need to sort out by finding the correct bag tag and reuniting it with the appropriate baggage. I love the concept, although the crying of these things can be really obnoxious. On the one hand, the crying helps you locate the baggage, but at times it can be the most prominent sound in the game and ruin some moments. Then there's memory vaults, which you need to chase down and hit, which then allows you to see the memories someone has stored away. These are great because they help to reveal some of the pride and pain in each character, and it shows that there's more to these characters and their stories than you might actually think. Finally, you have mental cobwebs, which you need to clear with a web duster later in the game to collect and trade in. 
Since you won't really be able to clear some of these until later in the game, these help to give players, particularly completionists, some different areas and secrets to access later on when revisiting locations. Really though, I just want to appreciate how clever and perfect all of these collectibles are in name and in concept. Finally, I think the best part of Psychonauts is the overarching game structure, including the extremely varied level design, and how these levels can act as incredibly interesting and creative looks at the human psyche, and I think the great writing and attention to detail is part of what makes this part so strong. In the game, using a little door called the Psycho Portal, you're able to jump into people's minds, almost akin to Inception. To talk about this section, I'm going to recap the different levels in the game, so another spoiler warning ahead. So before, I already mentioned how the summer camp is a great area to get used to the platforming in the game. However, even if you were to skip out on this initial exploration, you still get thrown into a strong initial tutorial with basic braining. Basic braining sees you in the mind of Coach Oleander, and the setting is one where you're put through an ongoing military battle. Here, you learn about the collectibles of the mental world I mentioned earlier, and they introduce you to pretty much every type of platforming you'll need to do in the game. Jumping, swinging, climbing, rope walking, sliding. Then you have a section where you get to learn and practice the melee combat. It can be a bit annoying and hilarious because of the two kids cheering you on the whole time. Yay, shut up, shut up, shut up! We'll never give up on you, Riz! But I think it was a solid way to give you tutorial and place to practice without just saying, hey, here's how you punch. You then get into some more varied platforming sections, including an incredibly trippy one, which again, I think are good introductions to some of the ideas we'll see later on in the game. After basic braining, you can then enter Sasha 9 and Mia Vodello's minds. However, something you realize looking back is that these next two levels or so are actually tutorials as well. Sasha's, 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 Sasha's shooting gallery teaches you to use the marksmanship ability to shoot enemies and insults to good taste. Oh, it's so tacky. I can't look directly at it. It also introduces you to your first real enemies, including sensors, which Sasha notes as an integral part of any sane person's mind. While I think it was smart to include a tutorial for the shooting and targeting, I do think this level could have been shortened. I felt like the lesson overstayed its welcome, as it makes you go through the same exercise over, and over, and over, and over again, before finally throwing you against the final boss. I think where this level is particularly interesting is the fact that it's the second mind you visit, and Sasha even makes a point of how It's time you saw what an organized mind looks like. And it's quite jarring. Where Oleander's mind is a battlefield and chaotic, Sasha's is clean organized, and seemingly empty. However, through the different areas of the level, as well as the memory vaults in Sasha's mind, you learn that, as hard as someone might try, they can't repress everything in their psyche. In particular, you find one memory which shows how Sasha lost his mother at a young age, and through the landscape that explodes out, like the giant bed and boxes littered across the floor, you get a glimpse into the life and mind of Sasha 9, and everything he works hard to control. The next level, Mia's dance party, is very much the opposite of Sasha's. Mia's personality is one which is more happy-go-lucky, and this is reflected in her mental world. Her entire mind is a dance party, where she's at the top level enjoying herself. However, if you explore the world, you find that Mia has some dark memories stored away, including one where she loses her children at an orphanage. In that same area, you also have your first run-in with nightmares, which you see that Mia, thankfully, has kept under control. You learn that, despite the facade of a happy and upbeat person, even Mia can only do so much to hide the pain she has underneath. As a level, Mia's Dance Party is a tutorial to learn how to use the Levitation ability, which is an important one which you'll need for the rest of the game. Getting used to the Levitation Ball isn't the easiest, and in this level, they teach you to roll, jump, float, ride air currents, and avoid obstacles using the ball. There's also a section which puts you in a ball race, which can be a bit frustrating if you hit an obstacle, but overall, I think this level is fairly straightforward. Similar to Sasha's Shooting Gallery, I do think this level is maybe a tad long, but I also think it does a good job of putting you in situations you'll face later on in the game, without being nearly as repetitive as the last level. Next, you face the Brain Tank, who's a pretty interesting boss. The tank actually isn't the easiest to figure out at first, but beating the two stages of the boss requires you to utilize the different skills you learned up to that point, so I think it's actually a good post-tutorial fight. Next, you're in the underwater lair of the Lungfish, where you come face to face with the lake monster that was teased earlier on in the game. This level is a mix of platforming as well as some combat with the lungfish. The level also does something unique where you view the game through the point of view of the monster, which is a cool concept, but I think in execution, it's not amazing. It's just a tad too slow moving in my opinion and can be a bit of a drag as a result. Later, you fight the lungfish and this part can be a bit finicky. Honestly, this is probably one of my least favorite parts of the game. Thankfully, after beating the lake monster, this is where the game really begins throwing some curveballs at you. Using the Psycho Portal, you jump into the Lungfish's mind and you find yourself in Lungfishopolis. 
Raz, in the mind of the lungfish, appears as a Godzilla or King Kong type monster named who wreaks havoc on the city. This is particularly interesting as it reveals how the lungfish sees you and other humans as a monster, although in this case, a helpful one. Your goal in the level is to help a hilarious group of freedom fighters to take out the mysterious radio tower which another monster, Kochamara, uses to control the mind of the monster and pacify the populace. As a kid, I absolutely loved this level, and while I do still think it's a great concept and maybe the funniest level in the game, there are definitely some areas that could have been better. For one thing, the movement feels a bit odd. It's understandably slow given Raz's supposed size, but because of this, it can become unnecessarily frustrating at times when trying to climb along buildings. Even so, I still think it's silly fun, running around grabbing tanks and smashing buildings. It's my school! Hooray! Here, they also give you the Shield Merit Badge which allows you to block attacks from tanks, as well as from the boss later. This boss is Kochamra, who is a fun parody of supervillains who call out the name of their every attack. Overly intricate combination! Once you learn the different attacks and patterns, he's honestly pretty easy to beat, and really you just need to time the shield. After getting rid of Kochamra's hold on the lungfish, you learn her real name. Linda. And you gain the ability to call her to ferry you between the summer camp and the asylum. At the asylum, you meet Boyd, a clearly disturbed figure who is apparently the guard to the asylum. You enter his mind and you're welcome to... The Milkman Conspiracy. Maybe the most iconic level of the game. And for good reason. Seriously, just look at the design of this stage. It's truly mind-boggling and dizzying with its winding and twisted streets and nearly identical suburban homes. It can actually make you feel a bit lost, despite the layout being actually fairly straightforward. Throughout the entire level, eyes and cameras are constantly following you as you begin your search for the milkman. This level is a perfect representation of Boyd's mind, embodying the paranoia and confusion which has clearly taken over him. Can't you see? Here, you learn the ability of clairvoyance, an ability which allows you to see through the eyes of another, and I gotta say, this is probably one of the most unique abilities I've ever seen in any game ever. This ability is also pretty hilarious as you can try it out on just about anyone to see how others see you. This idea leads to the main concept of the level. Throughout the level, you run into the G-Men, these robotic-sounding, totally not undercover agents searching for the milkman. The G-Men will be seen working different areas and only allow Raz to enter an area if he's carrying a specific item to show that Raz is one of them. So for example, if Raz wants to enter the plumber area, you need to first find the plunger to convince them that you're indeed one of them. I work in the sewers. As do I. We must stick together against those who would judge us. In this level, you'll go from house to house and area to area searching for the different items you need to advance, and in so many ways this level is much more similar to a point-and-click adventure than any of the previous ones. Using these different items and clairvoyance, you're able to slowly uncover the secrets behind Boyd's mind, and find the Milkman. Turns out he's buried deep inside and hidden away by a psychotic troop of Girl Scouts and their den mother. Go girl! Protect the milk! The boss fight here against the den mother is another interesting one, which requires you to use clairvoyance to see through her eyes so that you can find where she's hiding in the dark. I think it's a pretty unique concept and a nice way to cap off the clairvoyance spell that they introduced. After helping Boyd to rediscover the milkman, he opens up the gates to the asylum. Here you find that you need to get past a very blind orderly by disguising yourself as the creepy dentist, Dr. Lobato. In order to do this, you need to obtain three items from three of the residents of the asylum. You can really do these stages in any order, but I'll discuss it in the order you roughly meet them. First, you enter the world of Gloria's theater. Here you meet Gloria, a former actress who seems to be suffering from bipolar disorder and constant mood swings, going from kind and graceful Say. Would you like to hear the story of how I won that award, dear boy? To absolutely hostile if you get on her bad side. Hey! What? You're supposed to be dead! <gasps> ah! When you enter her mental world, you find yourself at a performance venue with an acting troupe whose star refuses to leave the dressing room. Part of the reason for this is the fact that there's a big ugly creature named the Critic, a representation of Gloria's inner critic, who's constantly heckling from his seat, as well as the mysterious phantom who attempts to ruin the theater and keep Gloria from shining. In order to beat the first section of the level, you need to find and act out different plays which can trigger certain things to happen. You can run these plays on different stage sets which, again, can trigger different outcomes. To add even more variation, above the stage you have the mood lighting, a candlelit comedy and tragedy mask which can change the mood and parts of the plays and stage sets. This works well as both a level mechanic as well as a representation of Gloria's mood swings. With these different parts available to you, you need to run the right plays, on the right sets, with the right moods, in order to trigger and advance to the next sections. I think something else that's so interesting about these plays is one, these plays are stories from the life of Gloria, so you actually get a glimpse into her life. Mother, mother, tell me true of the dad I never knew. He was brave in thought and deed. Can't you hear his mighty steed? 
And then two, I also really like the fact that when you run the same plays with different moods, it can often lead to completely different takes on the same life event and show Gloria's personal issues with her family. Yeah, just ride on by, Sir Deadbeat's dad. Don't hang around to help raise your poor daughter, jerk. Similar to the Milkman conspiracy, this level in a lot of ways feels more like a puzzle game rather than a platforming game. I enjoyed the concept and I thought the plays themselves were funny, but I don't necessarily think it's the most fun part of the game in terms of puzzle design and it can honestly be a bit confusing to figure out what you're doing. Eventually you make it to the catwalks where you go through a platforming section and then a boss fight to defeat the Phantom, who, surprise surprise, is actually the inner critic. By defeating her inner critic, Gloria's son is finally able to shine and as a result, you help her control her mood swings and move on with her life. Next, you meet Fred Bonaparte, a man who seems to be dealing with multiple personalities, and one of those personalities is... Napoleon. Shut up, you fool! The battle is ours! Wellington is on the run! This is our moment of glory! Huh. Yes, that Napoleon, who is supposedly one of the ancestors of Fred. When you jump into Fred's mind, you find yourself in Waterloo World. Sacre bleu! I have been hit! You see Fred and Napoleon sitting at a board game table about to do battle. Fred has been unable to defeat Napoleon in the game, and as a result, Napoleon has not left him as he insists he gets his ancestor up to snuff. In this world, you find yourself jumping to the board game at two levels. In your larger form, you're able to manipulate the pieces and play the war game as a commander. The war game itself is fairly simple though. In order to win, you need to take the castle, and to do that, you need to visit the various houses on the board and recruit builders, farmers, and a knight. By going into your smaller form, you attempt to recruit soldiers through some mini-quests. Again, drawing on their adventure game roots, this level is a lot about finding specific items in the stage in order to appease each of the recruits. It combines a bunch of combat, platforming, and puzzle aspects, making Waterloo World one of the most interesting stages in the game. You eventually defeat Napoleon in the game, and now that Napoleon is proud of Fred- What? What is this? Fred! Did you do this? He finally stops haunting him, and Fred's mind is no longer battling with itself. Finally, in the upstairs of the asylum, you find Edgar, a painter who has severe artist block and anger issues preventing him from completing any of his paintings. He tells you that he's a painter whose wife left him for a bullfighter. You enter his mind and the first thing that really blows you away about this world is the crazy art scheme. It's a dark, blacklight filled neon world and I think artistically is the best stage in the game. You find Edgar trying to build a tower of cards to reach his beloved, but every time he gets close, the bull, Elodio, comes through and ruins the tower. Even so, Edgar cannot stop, and in his obsession, he continues the Sisyphean task. He asks you to search the city for four queens which have flown off and gone missing. The level design here is pretty unique because it takes place in the narrow streets of what appears to be a Spanish city. Really there is just one center road with some corridors and paths branching from there. Every few seconds the bull, Elodio, will run through the main road, knocking you back a section if you're too slow traversing between segments. This means you need to move quickly when on the main street. Under the beautiful Spanish city road, you find an underground sewer which is oddly designed like a high school hallway. As you make your way through the level, you can buy some paintings from friendly dogs. Well, maybe you can write it off on your taxes as a loss. A catastrophic loss. And placing these paintings in different spots will spawn in different objects. These objects can then help you reach different hidden areas, and I think this is a really cool platforming idea. Every once in a while you'll come across a queen card which you can jump into and face one of the animal themed wrestlers. Each one is slightly different with some different attack styles which you need to counter with your own abilities and I thought these were very enjoyable. Later, you finally meet the bullfighter who gives you the confuse ability which allows you to throw confusion grenades which often have hilarious results. Wait a minute, I think there might not be a conspiracy after all. It's possible I am suffering from paranoid delusions linked to an entity I call the Milkman who is, in actuality, the mummified remains of Abraham Lincoln. You collect the four cards and return to Edgar, but find he has disappeared. You head to the bullfight and there, you fight Elodio. What you end up learning though is that the bull is actually Edgar, who was actually a high school wrestler whose nickname was The Bull. Instead of losing his girlfriend to a bullfighter, he actually lost her to a male cheerleader, and in his resulting depression, he ended up losing his wrestling matches, as well as his friends. The bullfighter then tries to kill Edgar. The fight with the bullfighter is similar to the fight with El Odio, but this time you also need to protect the bull from getting hurt too much. In the end, you help Edgar get over his obsession with the past and move on. It's alright, it's okay, we'll win the game some other day. Ah, <laughs> uh, please. Edgar, look at them. They're too pathetic to hurt you anymore. Can't you just let it go? How embarrassing. I can't believe I was hung up for so long over these losers. Um, uh, I, I always loved you more. 
I just love this level as a whole. The whole level design just reflects Edgar's state of mind so well. The Spanish city on top of the high school hallway. The bull, which is really himself, constantly keeping him away from finishing the tower and reaching his beloved. I think it's just a beautiful level, and it was a great way to represent how we might get tied up and hurt by the lies we tell ourselves, and the anger we keep inside. Then, after tricking the orderly, you begin your trek up the asylum. This is honestly one of my least favorite parts of the game. The mice are probably the most annoying enemy in the game. Their sound effects, the confusion explosion that they make, I just hate everything about it. The platforming in the level is frustrating and inconsistent. The level is also dark and winding, and makes me suffer from motion sickness as a result as well. This level actually made me quit the game as a kid. After getting through the asylum, you end up fighting the brain tank again, but instead of a blueprint, this time you face the real thing. I thought this fight was cool, but it can definitely take some figuring out. I like that similar to other boss fights, it makes you use a variety of the abilities you learned in the game. And now, we finally make it to the infamous Meat Circus. The Meat Circus was a notoriously difficult level. It's since been patched in the Steam version to have better checkpoints, but even so, as a level, it'll definitely kick your ass a couple times. The level of difficulty was a complaint among many, as the platforming was way more difficult compared to anything you experienced in the game before. As such, I do think this is a valid criticism, because for a majority of the levels you just played, the platforming was really secondary to the puzzle aspects of the game. Even so, I actually like the level for the most part, and I like how there's different sections in the level. From an escort mission, which is honestly the hardest part of the level, to a platforming section, to a boss fight, to another platforming section, and then a final boss fight where you get to play as a gigantic psychic energy monster. While I do have some thoughts on how the final level could have been better, I also think that the Meat Circus was a pretty satisfying ending to the game. What I will say I think could have been improved in the level was maybe incorporating all the different abilities we had learned in one section or another. I think you can beat the level using maybe 4 or 5 abilities, so I think that the level could have been better designed in a way to incorporate all the abilities, even if just a little bit. From a psychological perspective, I think this level isn't quite as deep as the others, but I'll talk about it anyway. After beating the brain tank controlled by Oleander's brain, Raz gets de-brained but manages to jump into the tank with Oleander. In the storage vat, the mines meld together and you're sent into a disturbing amalgam of Oleander and Raz's pasts. You find out that Coach Oleander has been going mad and at the bottom of it is some childhood trauma he had with his father, the Butcher, who killed a bunny Oleander loved. Raz's own family trauma with his dad and his family curse gets pulled in as well, and the two dads try to destroy Raz and young Oli. By helping Oli and also facing his own personal fears, Raz is able to help Oleander and himself get over their daddy issues, and Oleander's mind is set straight. The game ends on some cutscenes showing Raz and his father now having a better relationship, and also teasing at Psychonauts 2 with the kidnapping of Lily's dad. And that's Psychonauts. The game definitely has some flaws, but hopefully I was able to illustrate how great writing, a great world and concept, as well as unique level design helped to create this masterpiece. So with all that being said, how can Psychonauts 2 live up to the hype? What more can the game really do? Keep in mind, I'm not some sort of expert writer or designer, but based on what we've discussed, I think here are the main areas where Psychonauts 2 can beat its predecessor. 1. Improve the platforming. If they can get the game feeling like a modern platformer, like Mario Odyssey or A Hat in Time, then I think this will already be a huge step for the game. 2. Create awesome and different levels. Especially considering how the discussion around mental illness has changed in the last few years, I think there's really an interesting opportunity here to explore and represent different illnesses and states of mind in the different levels. Additionally, given how varied the first game was, I think they can really open up the level design and mechanics way more than before. I really hope they experiment with some really off-the-wall ideas. 3. Creating awesome levels around different abilities. So I think a lot of the abilities they already have are great, but I think there's a ton of other possibilities including some which they've already teased at. This includes reading minds, seeing the future, speaking to animals or plants, manipulating time, teleportation, mind control, tracking or sensory abilities, and maybe even some more movement abilities which I could see potentially creating some cool unique puzzles and platforming sections. Number 4. Improving the Ending While I do like the Meat Circus, I understand the complaints around it and I think that, to bring the game full circle, they should really work to present challenges which make you use your different abilities you earn throughout the game. I don't mind having difficult platforming, but don't forget what's at the heart of Psychonauts. And there you have it. I honestly think I could keep talking if I wanted to, but this is likely going to be my longest video yet, but hopefully, through this video I was able to show you why I, and so many others, are hyped for Psychonauts 2. And of course, if you enjoyed that video, please consider hitting that like and subscribe button, and maybe even commenting down below. I want to hear from you guys. Have you played Psychonauts and what did you think of it? And as usual, I hope you have a great rest of your day. Peace.